Good morning and welcome, um, everyone. Uh, I'm, my name is Nalanjan Sarkar. I'm the Deputy Director of the LSE South Asia Centre here in London. And I am delighted to say good morning instead of good afternoon today, because our events usually start at half past three. Um, and we are actually able to, sorry, I have two microphones on. Um, and um, today is a unique event because we are collaborating with the La Salle School of Arts in Singapore. And in order to cover the time difference, uh, literally across the half the globe, uh, we are having this event at half past 11. And I'm delighted that so many people have joined us. Um, it is a very special event also because for a considerable amount of time, uh, the South Asia Center, which was established in 2015 at the LSE, uh, has been thinking of doing events on the diaspora. And last year, in our faculty advisory group meeting, it was decided that we would proactively try to do events on the diaspora uh, in all parts of the world, because South, the diaspora from different countries of South Asia have such a presence all over the world. World And in fact, next year, 2022, marks 50 years of, of the arrival of um, in, um, the Indian refugee diaspora from East Africa. Um, it's, it's going to be 50 years next year. So uh, I'm very, very happy and, and very grateful to everyone uh, for having agreed to do this inaugural event, uh, which we are doing in collaboration with, with the La Salle School of Arts. What is of particular interest in this series of events is the various ways, the different ways, as you will hear later um, today uh, in, in, in the course of this event, the different ways in which South Asian communities, South Asian families, individuals actually uh, navigate for practical purposes their way through what initially is to them a foreign setting, a foreign cultural setting and a foreign societal setting. And uh, we will hear uh, not only about the South Asian diaspora in the West with a capital W, but also in Southeast Asia. Um, a very warm welcome and a very big welcome to our audience. Uh, so many of you have, have shown interest. So many of you have emailed me uh, to ask more about it. Um, and I'm delighted that some of you can join us. Um, an unedited version a uh, recording of this event will be available from tomorrow morning on our website in the events archive page uh, for those who may want to go back to it later or for those who may not have been able to log in today because in, here in the United Kingdom it is half past 11 and it is um, a time for, for lectures and, and so on and so forth. Um, the chat function is enabled on YouTube. Uh, the event is being held via Zoom and is being live streamed on YouTube and um, you are very welcome and very warmly invited to ask questions. You can ask questions to individual panelists. You can ask questions to the entire panel. If you're going to pose a question to an individual panelist, please do mention them by name and I'll pose the question to that particular uh, person. Now, if this event had been held on site at LSE, audience members at LSE have the right to ask a question in a public event without revealing their own identity. And in keeping with the spirit, uh, when I ask questions, I will not be mentioning the names of the people uh, who are asking the questions, even though I understand that on YouTube, their names are, are, are visible. Um, so without further ado, um, it is my very pleasant duty now to uh, introduce the speakers. I'll introduce the speakers um, in the order in which they're going to speak. I will reintroduce them before each of them begin to speak for those of you who may be joining us later in the, the program and may not be able to hear this introduction. And once all the panelists have finished speaking, uh, the, the discussant will begin the discussion. And you're of course, once again, very warmly welcome to uh, pose questions. Our first speaker, Dr. Venka Purushottaman, is Deputy President and Provost in the Office of the President of the La Salle College of the Arts in Singapore. Venka's PhD in academic research is in cultural policy and Asian cultural studies. And at La Salle, his academic and other work has focused on the response of education to the changing cultural landscape of the region. I'm hoping that Venka will make some general comments because a lot of what we are talking about today was initially in fact uh, triggered by, by, by a few thoughts uh, from, from 
uh, Venka, and of course speak about what he does and his own research and his own observations. Sean McLaughlin is Professor of the Anthropology of Islam, Mus Muslim Diasporas at the University of Leeds. And over the years, Sean has done a variety of research work and led projects on the Muslim diaspora in Britain, including the South Asian Muslim diaspora. Uh, there are several projects that he has either led, been principal investigator in, or has been part of, but I'll mention in particular, uh, one of his more interesting ones for me, the HRC, AHRC project on the Bradford Museum, which about which I'm hoping he will say something today, as also his recently concluded project on British Muslims and the Hajj. Sandini Podar is an art historian from the Global South, and we are particularly grateful to Sandini for joining us today because Sandini has very kindly uh, agreed to discuss the art of Zarina Hashmi, whose work speaks very strongly to diasporic identity. For those of you who just may not know, uh, Zarina was born in India, lived for the longest time in the United States, was based in New York, and died last year. Uh, Sandini is going to correct me if I'm wrong, last year in London, um, in fact. And uh, here, and uh, Sandini is going to discuss her art. And it is actually very, very fascinating. And I'm looking forward very much to hearing um, Sandini's views on, on the, the, the diasporic uh, element in Zarina's, Zarina's work. Last but certainly not the least, my friend and colleague, Dr. Zehra Jumaboy, is currently lecturer in Nation Art Histories at the La Salle uh, College of the Arts in Singapore. Um, Zehra has very kindly uh, agreed to be the discussant and she will make her own comments and then begin the discussion uh, amongst um, the, the speakers and then we'll do a question and answer session. I should mention here the name of Jeffrey Say, who is our other colleague. Zehra, Jeffrey and I together uh, have put this series uh, at, at, at one place. Jeffrey is an art historian uh, of Southeast Asia and teaches at the La Salle. Um, School of the Arts. So without more taking more time, Venka, uh, please speak now. You have about eight minutes. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Milanjan, for the introduction. And, and really, you know, I, I uh, thank uh, Jeffrey, Zara, and yourself for this kind invitation on discussing such an important and deep topic. Um, I must say, I do start with a degree of trepidation uh, uh, with a topic as big as this. Uh, and, and clearly, you know, it, it, it brings about certain uh, uh, considerations that we always have to be mindful that continuously lurks around when we talk about such uh, uh, issues. I must caveat that I'm not a historian specializing in Indian or diasporic systems, but bring three reference points uh, to contribute to this topic. Uh, first, I remain a, a, a student of post-colonial literature and films and art, mainly from South and Southeast Asia, having been schooled, you know, uh, in the theoretical contributions of Spivak, Said, and Baba, you know, the, the trinities of, of uh, uh, post-colonial uh, theories and all that. But really my transformation of engaging with you know, the, the, the context of the diaspora really emerged with my own conversations with artists and particularly writer Michael Ondaje in, in the 90s, which were crucial to bringing life to these theoretical framings and how I do see the world uh, in relation to the diaspora. Um, today, this has informed how I read cultural policies in Asia and, and how it shapes the relationship between communities within Southeast Asia through festivals, events, biennales, and even collectivism. I'm also particularly interested in the manner decoloniality functions in education and cultural relations as nation states rapidly respond to a digital world. And that is seemingly agnostic to cultural representation, yet potent in flaring sectarianism in different forms. So these are, this is one of the, my first consideration. The second consideration I have is I'm an art writer. You know, while I, I do research quite actively in, in, in the field of cultural policy and, and cultural studies, I primarily like to engage with artists through conversations. And artists bring an insight into how notions of self-representation in spaces are used in the world of identity and politics to highlight cultural differentiation. My third entry point is really uh, of myself. I am a third, fourth generation Singaporean whose lineage is South Asian, part, uh, part Indian, part, you know, part Southeast Asian, part Ceylonese, part 
Telugu, uh, Tamil. Um, and this feeds my curiosity as to the relationship to my space in Singapore has with my past and the journey of thousands of individuals who would have traveled the Indo-Pacific pre-colonial period. And that framing is important uh, in, in how I actually see the, the notion of entry and exits within the diaspora. For the matter that, you know, to think about the diasporic practice is to see, see it outside of the convention of the nation migrant access and to really look at participatory practices in which arts, travel and education can really function to define diasporic practices. Much of the discourse around diasporic practices have been very much again uh, mapped against these uh, nation migration access, which uh, we, we find that increasingly being challenged in a highly uh, uh, mobile world. But I must start with the obligatory history as vast as it might be uh, uh, in, in Southeast Asia. And just to give a context to, to uh, uh, listeners and viewers, India's proximity to Southeast Asia has actually shaped the Indianization and Sanskritization of Southeast Asia prior to the arrival of the Europeans from the 14th century onwards. The Chola and the Pallava kingdoms of the now Tamil Nadu uh, shaped the culture that which is antiquated in Southeast Asia from Angkor Wat in Cambodia to the Shiva Vishnu temples in Prabhana in Indonesia. So language, religion, cuisine flowered through maritime activities and continue to thrive. So through the centuries, these have been still very much alive and vibrant. Post 14th century, the colonial enterprise, as we know, started to see the Portuguese, Dutch, French, and the British, you know, come well into these parts of the world and really start to build that cradle. This maritime zone became the cradle between the, the, the East and the West and became the cradle between India and China. It became the cradle between the Indo-Pacific and the Asia-Pacific and continues to be fraught in that kind of uh, 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 ambit and will continue to move through while maritime still continues to be uh, rich and, and, and uh, enabled uh, through uh, econo economies and, and commerce. Post-colonial Southeast Asia uh, uh, continues this relationship with India even today through trade, tourism, and economic migration, and more importantly, the import-export of humans as skilled and unskilled resource. In all of these movements, they all have a profound effect on how Southeast Asia continues to thrive through its relationship with uh, India. So if you really want to get uh, 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 statistical, then you start to really look at the, the population sizes of you know, Malaysia, for example, having uh, the world's largest diaspora of Indians, particularly more so from uh, uh, South India. Uh, more than 2 million people are there. In Singapore, you already have more than you know, 900,000, you know, excluding those who are coming as uh, economic workers uh, in, 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 in Singapore. And then you, you've get, and then these are all spotted through their own townships and, and ways people have encultured themselves. So my, in that sense, my kind of lengthy segues intent to underscore an inimitable reality that the theoretical lens of diaspora must necessarily consider the lift and living movement of peoples and culture in Southeast Asia. The truth of the matter is Southeast Asia is not isolated or remote from South Asia. It is integrated through a carefully crafted system of trade and movement, hybridizing the everyday lives of contemporary South Asians today and Southeast Asians today. And that flow continues. And of course, there has been, you know, uh, historically uh, new cultures that have emerged and what we will call the Peranakan cultures in Malaysia and, and, and Singapore or the Chitti cultures, you know, uh, who have lived there even pre-colonial times and who have really created new ways of shaping cultural identity throughout our populations that's there. But while we have that, and Southeast Asia is very interesting in the sense that while it has this kind of wonderful relationship with the Indo-Pacific through the flow of maritime, it also has a counterpoint to this, which is East Asian dimension through China, Korea, and Japan. And that also continues to be a thriving rich resource of flow that continuously gets negotiated throughout Southeast Asia. And both parts continuously, you know, negotiates the enterprise of how Southeast Asia has a political category gets described and designed and how it gets fraught in the uh, geopolitical debate. 
So in many ways, one of the things that you'd find in Southeast Asia is nostalgia, space, and hybrid identities would start to get syncretized into everyday experiences. And you'd see them coming together quite effectively. Nostalgia and spaces are demarcated by extreme stock histories and memories, enabling what policy experts might call creative placemaking. And, and, and these gets uh, in, uh, emboldened in particular ways. And you'd see them very much in, in big cities today. Uh, little Indias, quote unquote, little Indias, all right, uh, from in Singapore, Malaysia, Myanmar, create an effect that fosters economic activity. But in most of these major cities, these are realities. However, in Southeast Asia, the living trade is generational. These little Indias have been there for, you know, centuries in many ways. And hence, this is often problematized by how do you galvanize a new citizenry as you move forward? And this is often a discussion that is important and I hope hopefully we'll have an opportunity to talk about this later. So uh, in a place like Singapore, ancient practices and contemporary exist, expressions coexist galvanizing ideas of plur plurality and multiculturalism against an essentialistic monocultural uh, expression of Indianness. A little India is not that which, is, which we would see. Hence when new arrivals encroach into this particular social space, tensions might arise. The new arrivals might create new tensions. Artists have been looking uh, at enabling new cultural critique of that which has of that who have arrived. So they have also been disrupting you know, pre and colonial cultural forms and trying to develop hybrid forms that pose strategic challenges to concepts of the citizen. This is where you are find, we are finding new generation of young artists who are coming to self-invent themselves, trying to break out of these essentialist qualities that you know, nation states hold down to in terms of spaces, in terms of you know, uh, uh, rituals and nostalgia. And how do you start to blend that which forms a new identity? And here, that's where the exit points will start. The conversation I, I framed was the fact that of my own intergenerational experience of being third, fourth generation uh, uh, South Asian in, in, in Singapore or, or being Singaporean. And when I go into India, I'm a tourist in many forms, and yet I can facilitate myself within those languages and those cultures, which enables me to have those conversations. And yet I, I'm able to take a leaf out of both sides and balance and be on, you know, uh, on a bridge that continuously ensures the twain shall meet in some form. Thank you. Thank you very much, Venka. That was, that was brilliant, not only for what you said, but also by way of, of beginning uh, the conversation. Uh, we are going to go ahead, but before that, would I say that I did not miss the fact that you mentioned Spivak Said and Baba in the same breath. I did not, <laughs> did not miss it. Uh, and, and I make note of the fact that for good reason you mentioned it. Um, as well. We will come back to several of the things that you do mention, uh, but there is, and I'm hoping this is going to come out in the other presentations as well, is the whole question of, of this whole question of, of galvanizing a new citizenry, to use your phrase, as also the role of nostalgia and new identities. And, 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 and you know, um, for, for those of us who live in Britain and particularly in England, uh, we see this in so many forms, in so many ways, in so many communities uh, of, of, of migrants and, and diaspora. Uh, but thank you also for drawing the very important uh, and often missed distinction between um, migrants and, and diaspora. Um, Sean McLaughlin is professor of the Anthropology of Islam and Muslim Diasporas at the University of Leeds. And over the years, Sean has done a variety of research work and at projects on the Muslim diaspora in Britain, including the South Asian Muslim diaspora. Of his many very interesting projects is one on the Bradford Museum and also his recently concluded project on British Muslims and the Hajj. Sean will speak now. You have about eight minutes and then we'll come back to you. Thanks. Thank you very much um, to the LSE and to LaSalle College. Uh, I'm delighted to be speaking to you and delighted to be sharing um, these platform with uh, my colleagues. Um, so just in terms of a few initial remarks, um, I think what Venka was saying about uh, traveling cultures is very interesting. If we think about the way in which, for instance, um, Islam traveled into South Asia 
and then uh, uh, moved in a sense uh, from South Asia to to Britain. Um, so I think sometimes these um, bigger histories are very significant. And of course, we can also say too that um, the experience of British Empire um, is entirely formative in the construction of British Muslim communities and those um, long histories um, still have great efficacy uh, today, not least in terms of the ways in which uh, categories like religion, the secular race uh, are constructed. Now, um, I am uh, an ethnographer and um, I was sort of trained and probably got lost somewhere between the study of religion, Islam and anthropology. Um, I'm also of migrant background myself. Um, all of my family are Irish and um, uh, without being glib, um, I often found quite a lot of connections between um, the Pakistanis I met in the north of England, um, particularly those from um, agricultural backgrounds, uh, religious devotional backgrounds. And uh, there were many things um, that uh, we shared in that um, of a heritage and, of course, uh, many uh, divisions uh, in terms of social reality, too. Um, I want to um, focus mainly on um, the work that I have done amongst Pakistani heritage communities in the north of England um, since the 1990s, um, and especially work on Bradford, which, as you may know, um, has the largest percentage of Pakistanis, um, people of Pakistani heritage and of Muslim heritage um, in the UK back in the 1960s. Bradford was seen as a pioneering uh, reference point for wider debates about uh, race uh, relations um, and eventually multiculturalism. But from the 1980s onwards, Bradford has very often been associated with uh, bad news, bad news often with translocal connections, um, whether it's so-called imported imams or uh, transcontinental marriages, uh, importing poverty, uh, as one politician put it back in the 2000s. So I'm very interested in these um, translocal connections. And um, in a moment, I'll talk a bit more about um, how I frame self, space and diasporic practice in my work. But um, I did want to uh, reference uh, the project um, that Nilanjan uh, mentioned. Um, this was a project with lots of academics, practitioners, museum staff, um, working together at the National Science and Media Museum in Bradford. Now, the project ran uh, 2017 to 21. Um, I was very much a co-investigator. Um, I'm not a, a museum specialist, although I did uh, work a bit with the British Museum on a Hajj exhibition back in 2012. What was interesting um, about this project was that um, it sought to better connect the museum to local communities, including local Muslim communities, and explore ways in which the museum um, could tell stories about its sound and vision technologies um, that were in its collections um, through the experience of everyday life of people in the city. And it's really at this point that a focus on diaspora and uh, living translocally um, came to the fore in my work. So I'm very much interested in how um, Pakistani communities in Bradford become rooted in that city, having moved uh, generations uh, ago now, uh, but also remain connected to people and places elsewhere. And it's this sort of phrasing um, that we've used in the project um, that I rather like. Uh, I also like um, Stephen Vertebeck's phrasing of diaspora uh, in terms of an awareness of multi-locality. And uh, in particular, uh, I'm very keen to uh, I suppose, move beyond 
um, as so many of those post-colonial theorists did in the 1990s, move beyond a preoccupation in, dias in diaspora studies with uh, looking back to the homeland. Certainly that's been very important in the formation of communities. Uh, for instance, the way in which uh, rituals in places like mosques are uh, a remembrance of what happened back at home. Um, but at the same time, I want to move beyond um, diaspora as homeland or indeed homelessness um, to think about the new dwelling places um, that are constructed in localities. Um, so there's a critique there, I suppose, that moves through classic theories of diaspora, uh, takes on board post-colonial uh, theory, but also comes back to an anthropological concern with what's going on uh, on the ground. So I suppose my headline would be that um, there are multiple ways in which we can examine diasporas as placed, as reaching across places, uh, and also reaching beyond uh, place. Um, so, for instance, if we think about Muslims in Bradford, um, they become deeply placed in terms of uh, setting down roots, building up institutions. Um, they remain connected deeply to uh, families and friends back at home. And of course, the technologies available to enable that have been radically transformed. Um, if we think back to even the 1950s and 60s, um, some people talked about uh, the way in which uh, in a village uh, in rural Kashmir, um, you'd have to perhaps find someone who could read to, to tell you the news from Bradford um, about births and deaths. Uh, or if you wanted to take a telephone call, you might have to go to the local bazaar uh, where uh, a phone um, was uh, in place. So technologies have changed um, very radically. Now time is skipping by, um, so I just wanted to headline uh, some of the, uh, the types of exhibits that I worked on. And in particular, um, I was interested in how Islamic soundscapes were reconstructed in Bradford using technologies um, beginning perhaps with the ways in which uh, mosques broadcast um, the Avan, um, uh, also the way in which they adopted uh, radio technologies to narrow cast um, what was happening in the mosque uh, to home. And there were interesting uh, themes around X access and exclusion here. Um, in some ways, uh, these radios opened up um, the the home to what was going on in the mosque, but this could also be a way of, 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 of justifying why women would perhaps not visit the mosque. Um, we can talk too about the way in which um, apps give access to a global Islamic public sphere, a sphere um, reminders about prayer times, um, Quran recitations, replacing the old cassettes that used to circulate in these communities. And then a final example I will give um, is the way in which um, back in the 90s, um, the first Muslim radio station was established in the UK. And this, just after the Salman Rushdie affair, with so many negative representations of Muslims in Britain, um, was a way not just of celebrating Ramadan in public um, for the first time, but actually opening up a space for public debate um, amongst Muslims in Bradford. So a bit of a uh, tour there uh, and hopefully some prompts for further discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, thank you very much also for bringing in uh, your, your personal example. I thought I'd mention that one of the events we did a couple of weeks ago to mark uh, the centenary of Ireland uh, was on internationalism in the interwar period. But of, when we were thinking at, at LSE about what were the themes that we could focus on to do something that was uh, common between Ireland and South Asia, 
uh, one of the themes that we very seriously considered for a while was uh, the diaspora from Ireland and South Asia in Britain and in England in, in, in particular. Uh, that said, I admire as much your near complete uh, dissolution of your Irish accent. Um, so uh, given that I've, I've had Irish bosses in my life, um, I, I have to say I'm very struck by it, uh, but, but this has been great. Uh, you, do, you do raise, and you mentioned a few things, you know, which have happened in our lifetime, um, some under the affair, uh, especially, and, and, and you know, the attention it got over here. But I will come back to you later on as well in the discussion about the whole question of what you say about inhabiting multiple spaces, because I think this is partly also what, what Venka was saying. It's something that we all uh, discuss, um, those of us who are part of that also navigate it at, at, at everyday levels. Um, and, and I will give you some examples of what people have said to me over the many, many years that, you know, one has even inadvertently in social settings um, uh, um, had conversations uh, about, about identity, about diasporic identity. Uh, could I just announce once more before I introduce Sandini once again, uh, that for those in the audience who would like to ask a question, the chat function is open on YouTube. Please do feel free um, to ask questions. If you'd like to ask a question to the entire panel, then please do so. You're also equally welcome to ask a question to an individual speaker, in which case, please do mention who you are posing the question to. It is now my pleasure to introduce Sandini Podar, who is an art historian from the Global South, uh, is based in London. And we are very grateful to Sandini for agreeing to participate in, in uh, today's panel discussion, because Sandini will uh, speak about uh, the work of Zarina Hashmi, whose work uh, addresses very directly and very strongly um, questions of, of diasporic identity. Uh, I'm not going to say more about Sandini, uh, about Zarina, sorry, um, but and I'm sure Sandini will speak. Sandini, please do. Uh, Sandini has slides, of course, so uh, she will share her screen. Sandini, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to go to the slides so you can see uh, a beautiful photograph of uh, the artist in question, uh, Zarina Hashmi, who uh, preferred to go by the name of Zarina uh, in professional settings, uh, somebody I knew very closely for 20 years. Um, she was one of the first people I actually met when I moved to New York in 2001. And uh, she unfortunately died last year here in London. Um, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, that Zara asked me to uh, share a little bit about her life with you. It's hard to condense um, uh, uh, somebody like this in, in, in eight or nine minutes, but I'm just going to give you some salient points. Um, and I hope that that will spawn further research and further curiosity about Zarina's life and her practice. Um, so Zarina once said, memory is the only lasting possession we have. I have made my life the subject of my work, using the images of home, the places I have visited, and the stars I have looked up to. I just want a reminder that I didn't imagine my experiences. Born into a traditional Muslim family in Aligarh, India in 1937, Zarina received a bachelor's in mathematics from Aligarh Muslim University in 1958 and only later trained in printmaking techniques in Bangkok, Paris, and Tokyo. Um, I should just say, um, uh, Zarina was primarily known as a printmaker throughout her life, but um, uh, she was also a sculptor. And um, for people who are interested in, in art and art making practices, printmaking, of course, is a sculptural practice. You have to uh, carve and gouge the balsa wood in order to uh, apply the sumi ink and make the woodblock print, which is what her primary material was. Um, Zarina's university degree, alongside visits to Sultanate and Mughal architectural monuments and gardens in Agra, Fatehpur Sikri, and New Delhi, instilled in her an early love of geometry, refinement, and pattern. Her father, Sheikh Abdur Rashid, was a bibliophile and professor of medieval Indian history at Aligarh Muslim University. He had a private library in the Aligarh house, where Zarina and her siblings were permitted to play from time to time. 
The children lived primarily with their mother, Farmida Begum, in the Zanana, or the women's quarters. Zarina married, oh, I must say, this is a, a very beautiful um, woodblock print, um, sorry, an etching from 1994 called Father's House. And uh, you see um, an aerial view floor map of the, the distinction between her father's side of the house and her mother's um, uh, Zanana. And this is the, the house where she and her siblings grew up in Aligarh. Zarina married Indian diplomat Saad Hashmi in 1958 and left India to embark on a peripatetic life, which would encompass cities as diverse as Bangkok, New Delhi, Paris, Bonn, Tokyo, Los Angeles, Santa Cruz, and New York. A year later, in 1959, Zarina's parents left their Aligarh house and moved permanently to Pakistan. The trauma associated with partition, which Zarina experienced as a child, and the attendant feeling of being in permanent exile stayed with the artist. The woodcut dividing line from 2001 is an iconic woodblock print that sublimates Zirina's internalization of partition. She recalls when as a 10 year old child, she and her mother and elder sister Rani were sent to a refugee camp in Delhi for a few months before traveling onwards to Karachi. After attending a local school for a while, Zarina made her way back to Aligarh under her father's escort. She says, these memories have stayed with me and formed how I think about a lot of things, fear, separation, migration, the people you know, or you think you know, your friends and neighbors. I often think about the refugees that were coming from Pakistan or going to Pakistan. Trains would pull into the station and everyone on board had been killed. Families were split, homes destroyed. The fabric of life for millions of people was permanently altered. All this for a new border, this dividing line. In 1963, Saad and Zarina moved to Paris, where she immediately introduced herself to renowned British printmaker and painter, Stanley William Hayter. Hayter had founded the legendary printmaking studio Atelier 17 in 1927, frequented by artists such as Picasso, Giacometti, Miro, and several other stalwarts of 20th century art. She says, at Atelier 17, I learned etching and viscosity printing, but most importantly, I discovered abstraction. In 1968, the couple relocated to Delhi, at which point Zarina moved into a little studio of her own where she lived and worked. This is why she liked to be known simply as Zarina. This was a defining moment in her life and practice as she was coming into being as an artist in her own right. Zarina started working with found wood from the road, making relief prints through direct rubbings on the paper surface. This is an example. These compositions deal with motifs that recur throughout the artists of, such as the concept of home, architecture, and a notion of place as well as geometry, abstraction, and repetition. Zarina moved to New York, and uh, these are just some images of um, Zarina's retrospective that we held at the Guggenheim in New York in 2013 when I was a, a curator there. Zarina moved to New York in 1976 and became greatly involved with the feminist movement. She joined the faculty of the New York Feminist Art Institute founded in 1979 by women artists and educators. She also became a member of the Heresies Collective, founded in 1976 as a discursive platform for feminism, politics, and art. Between, um, these are some very beautiful works, which are hard to see um, because they're incredibly intimate. But um, when Zarina moved to New York in 76, uh, she was very depressed and isolated, sad, Hashmi died in, uh, a year later. Um, and this is really the beginning of her life as a professional artist, as a South Asian woman living by herself in her Manhattan studio. And she spent about three years or four years working on these, um, what, what later she would call her pin drawings, uh, which are literally just these 
very minimalist grid-like structures uh, pierced with a needle. Between 1992 and 97, Zarina taught printmaking at the University of California at Santa Cruz, while also continuing her studio practice in New York. This constant journey across the United States, as well as visits to Karachi to see her siblings and parents, led to works such as Crawling House, 1994 one of the few sculptural installations in Zarina's practice and an important work in her oeuvre. With its inherent precariousness, each home literally hangs from a single pin on the wall and references to travel and migration. The work embodies both a sense of belonging as well as dislocation. Here are some images uh, of the work in all its majesty in, um, installed at the Hammer Museum. So this is still part of Zarina's retrospective, which started at the Hammer, and then it came to New York, to the Guggenheim, and then later to the Art Institute of Chicago. The artist often turned to Urdu poetry and literature by Bahadur Shah Zafar, Mirza Ghalib, Muhammad Iqbal and Fez Ahmad Fez to formulate deep philosophical ruminations about life, time, travel, and the soul. In 1998, Zarina fought and won an ugly legal battle for the right to continue to live in her studio in Manhattan. The ensuing feeling of vulnerability catalyzed a portfolio of 36 woodcut prints titled Home is a Foreign Place, which is a magnum opus in her oeuvre. Zarina states, I made a list of Urdu words that embodied home for me, threshold, door, entrance, courtyard. In Pakistan, I had a calligrapher write out each word in Nastalik script. In New York, I developed an image to accompany each word. Language ties my work together. Urdu is home. It is interesting to note here that while the portfolio begins with an image of Zarina's childhood home in Aligarh and a gentle invitation to enter its rooms, it ends with an image of the border, of being locked out and unable to pass through. The early years of the new millennium were a turning point in Zarina's life and practice as she honed her political consciousness through art. After the events of 9-11, Zarina states, ethnic conflict changed my life. As the years passed, I found myself witnessing conflicts raged against Muslim communities around the world. Some of you might recall that this image was actually used by Arjun Apudarai as a, um, a cover of one of his publications. And uh, he, met, he met Zarina because of our work together at the Guggenheim. So these are just some images of different bodies of work. This is, of course, a, an aerial view, a mapping of Ahmedabad. Um, unfortunately, after uh, uh, the, the, the rioting and the, 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 the deaths of 2002 and 2003 in Godhra. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, history repeats itself. Uh, Zarina was also extremely um, worried and, and saddened and traumatized by what was happening with the Rohingyas between Myanmar and Bangladesh. And this was one of the last uh, woodblock prints that she made. She unfortunately um, got very ill in 2016 and, and passed away, as I mentioned, in 2020. In the end, Zarina felt exiled as an artist, a woman, a Muslim, a South Asian, a Pakistani, and an Indian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandini. Uh, that was really, uh, really, really awesome and extremely moving. And thank you for bringing um, a slice, no doubt, but a profound slice of the work of Zarina Hashmi to us. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to access it uh, without, your, without your kindness and, and generosity. Uh, it happens only rarely in my life given my own academic 
uh, research that I'm able to find a connection between events that have contemporary relevances in my own, but I thought I'd mention it to you, even if publicly, that Sheikh Abdul Rashid, Zarina's father, edited a text called the Tariq Firuz Shahi, which was written by a man called Ziauddin Barni, who was in the court of Sultan Muhammad bin Tughlaq. And my research is on Ziauddin Bani, my PhD is on Ziauddin Bani, which is the reason why I instantly recognized Sheikh Abdul Rashid's name. Uh, but I actually did not know, I knew of Zarina Hashmi separately, but I actually did not know that Zarina was Sheikh Abdul Rashid's um, um, daughter. And I obviously, because of my interest in Sheikh Abdul Rashid, I knew this whole movement to Pakistan and back and, you know, and, and, and the effect it had. Um, uh, we've heard our three speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm now going to invite uh, Dr. Zara Junipoy, who has very kindly agreed to be the discussant uh, for this event. Zara is currently lecturer in Asian Art Histories at the La Salle College of the Arts in Singapore. And uh, what we had discussed earlier when Zara and I spoke in fact yesterday was that Zara will make some initial comments and then we'll have a discussion and in the meantime, if there are questions, once again, I invite audience members to ask questions. If there are questions, then we can take those. Otherwise, we'll continue with the discussion. Zara, please speak now. Okay, thanks, Nilin Jain. Um, uh, yeah, that was that was so moving, and I have to I have to say that um, I'm, I'm still a bit teary. Something about Sandini talking about Zarina always makes me cry a little bit. Um, I suppose because in, in so many ways, Zarina not just represents this sort of, um, uh, this sort of the paradox of the notion of diaspora for South Asians. Um, and this is specifically why I wanted uh, Sandini to come and talk um, about Zarina within a panel like this. Um, uh, and I say paradox because I think, um, the, the case of uh, Zarina and her sort of uh, obsession with that notion of the threshold, the wall, uh, the border, the line, um, all of which are post-colonial theory tropes, particularly somebody like Homi Baba, who is obsessed with this notion of partition as a sort of almost like a, a, a linguistic um, trigger in some sense. But with, um, with someone like Zarina, the, the reality and the anguish of this uh, is really sort of uh, highlighted. And so when I, when I, when I say paradox um, of South Asian identity um, as a diasporic one, and and here sort of um, you know open it up uh, to a sort of discussion. It's also because um, there's a there's a twofold displacement con con contained within the Zarina experience, and the first, of course, is the sort of seminal um, experience of displacement for all. Uh, South Asians, whether or not they actually experienced it, um, which is partition, right? The very notion of an India, a Pakistan, and then a Bangladesh is formed on the basis of this migration. And that migration between the borders, whether or not your family actually did that, um, is, is something that has a legacy. So we're all, in some ways, as South Asians, are uh, inherently diasporic. Um, and then, of course, there's a there's a different angle, which is you know uh, the South Asian diaspora as having been displaced onto elsewhere. Um, um, whether that is um, in a Singapore case, which again is very different, or whether it is as a you know a post partition, as in the case of Zarina, um, going to New York and negotiating a place of home there, um, and this is kind of where I thought. Um, you know, I had a few points that I, I sort of took a few notes on the on the different speakers and a few sort of joining points that I thought we could kind of um, discuss. Uh, the first one being the idea of uh, the trickiness of the idea of diaspora and whether or not we can even see that it's a valid 
term, right? Um, particularly in today's context. And let me explain why. So when Vinka was speaking about the Singaporean Indian diaspora and the sort of problematics of Indianness on the one hand and a larger Southeast Asian identity on the other, um, you know, it's something that, you know, because I am Singaporean, <laughs> it's something that is act um, and come from a very old diasporic Singaporean family, uh, the Juma boys. Um, uh, uh, it's 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 something that's always been at the back of of my own self definition is how as in as an in Indian are you also uh, both diasporic and in some sense Singaporean, um, and so that kind of leads me to a larger question: is that at what point does one give up the definition of oneself as diasporic? Um, you know, I'm a fourth generation Singaporean, right? Um, and I've only decided that I'm I'm not Singaporean in terms of my self-definition, but I'd rather call myself Indian um, since uh, I kind of uh, started studying in Britain. So the weirdness um, of that term diaspora is that at some level, um, does it give a, a, a new nation um, a relatively new nation like Singapore, an excuse by using it um, to create a particular kind of national dissonance in the dealing of um, with the Indian community and the way in which they have an angle into Singapore and identity as a as the wider term. And of course, this um, for me also connects uh, a little bit about with what Sean was saying in terms of the Indian diaspora or the South Asian diaspora in Bradford. Um, and again, you know, there's sort of rather, um, I won't say anthropological, um, but it but it feels a little bit like that. Uh, look at uh, Bradford as a as a particular center for studying South Asian diaspora. I think we should also put this a little bit in brackets um, because it is one experience of the diaspora. And you know, one question is that are Sandini and I um, also part of an Indian diaspora, in which case our diaspora existence is so very different um, from a diaspora existence of somebody who is say, a, you know, second, third generation um, at Bradford. I mean, there, there is no similarity. <laughs> um, at all. Um, and hence, I also uh, wonder quite contentiously whether uh, sometimes the way in which we talk about diaspora um, is actually, again, a way of not talking about what we really want to talk about, um, which is in terms of a British narrative, uh, the problematics of the Muslim question. Uh, hidden under this term, uh, the problematics of um, uh, uh, as uh, Sean put it, um, importing poverty and the problematics of dealing with uh, Britain's own colonial guilt, um, which is very easy to sort of associate with um, a Bradford problem, but in a way puts Britain on rather on the back foot um, when you talk about a different kind of diaspora community. Um, that is a diaspora of mobility, uh, buying up large chunks of London and having a huge influence on the art world. Um, and of course, that's a diaspora perhaps Britishness can't quite um, adapt to because it's a different power dynamic. And certainly British identity doesn't come off um, it looking like the victor in that. And so, uh, yeah, this is, this is sort of the question I want to open up to is that what are the limits of the term diaspora? Um, and does it actually cover a multitude of territory that really, um, you know, doesn't really belong together? So um, I wonder if uh, Sean can answer that and first, and then let's see. <laughs> Sean, you're being put on the spot, so go for it in in both your identities as as as, as the whole shukriya <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, there can i just very briefly thank you for those uh, uh, very good remarks um we we'll just let the conversation flow uh freely for a while i do have one question that's just come in sandinits for you it's on zarina 
Uh, and uh, but but we we'll just take take this uh, question from here. There are several layers to what uh, um, Zahra has said, and we'll go round and 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 respond. And this is the moment when I am very happy to say publicly the advantage of being a chair is that I don't have to respond. So Sean, go. For it. Thank you very much, Zahra. There's so many different levels to uh, your critique there, and I think uh, you know you touch on so many. Uh, relevant points. Um, a couple of things that I might pick out and do feel free to, to bring me back and others can come in, of course, and uh, it will give me more time to think too. But um, I think one of the things I would like to say, first of all, is that um, in the project that I was working in and a previous project, uh, we produced a book called Writing the City in British Asian Diasporas, which mm. is with Routledge. And we were very deliberately trying to um, scale back from the idea of um, national diasporas, um, very much trying to push this idea of translocality. Um, and I do think that, um, in fact, we, we used the, the subtitle to our project from diaspora to multi-locality. And this is one of the reasons I mentioned Steve Vertebeck's ideas about awareness of multi-locality. And I do think that that frees us from that um, necessary uh, an ongoing and perhaps simplified connection um, between um, homeland and diaspora. And in particular, in the Muslim case, one of the things that we see, of course, among second, third generation um, uh, Pakistani post-migrants, um, if we can pile up the, the language and terms, is this sort of breaking out of those diasporic connections. Yes, parents and grandparents have those strong connections to Kashmir or to wherever, and uh, there's a respect that's there. But in terms of their own identities and uh, the way they prioritize their identities. Very often we've seen this shift from um, ethnic and diaspora identities to religious identities. And I think that's, that's a really interesting way in which um, similar processes are connected. It's still about connections to people and places elsewhere, but there's a sort of a reaching out beyond known diasporic connections to unknown connections. So, you know, the Pakistanis in 1990s, Bradford were reaching out to the Bosnians. Um, you know, white, blonde-haired Muslims, uh, very little cultural connection. Uh, and those sorts of processes have been elaborated ever more over the years with uh, young Bradford Muslims traveling abroad, engaging with a global Islamic public space. So really, um, you know, you would be right to ask in the end whether we've seen the end of diaspora uh, for at least some um, uh, Bradford uh, Pakistani heritage Muslims. Um, so I'll just make one point there rather than talk for 20 minutes, which I, I probably <laughs> might be want to do. So thanks. I wondered though, you know, when you talk about the sort of South, uh, the, the Muslim identity question, um, something that did occur to me is that, you know, you're talking very much about this sort of Pakistani community, um, but how does the Bangladeshi community fit into that definition? Would it? Um... Yes, that's really fascinating. And I think there are, uh, you know, you really begin to excavate different relationships to different identity formations here. And, um, you know, one of the things we, we in, the, in this project, Writing the City in British Asian Diasporas, we did try to highlight different um, UK cities that, in a sense, uh, had different histories behind them. So if we look at um, East London and, and the connections that run back from Brick Lane to Silhet and so on, um, you know, there are really interesting stories uh, around um, the importance of secularism, for instance, mm -hmm. that don't always appear uh, mm -hmm. in a city um, like Bradford. So I think, you know, there are so many different uh, trajectories and connections that, that 
that which is diasporic is 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 connected in so many different ways. So I think you know I would always want to highlight um, the the sense in which we if we scale back from the national and, and look at the local, we can investigate the multiple local connections that form um, diasporic connections very much from the bottom up. So they're always entirely particular and. Even the Pakistani community in Manchester has a very different history and background to somewhere like Bradford, far more middle class, um, uh, emigration from cities rather than from rural communities. So, um, you know, it's really all about plurality and, and difference. And uh, you're right to, to say, well, what holds it all together then, I suppose? Maybe this is somewhere when uh, Sandin, you can come in on the question of where language, um, you know, uh, sort of intersects with all of this. And uh, I, I really love that quote that you often use about, um, you know, how, how language was Zarina's home and particularly Urdu. And she makes it, if I'm not mistaken, from the time in which she was sort of um, after um, the second partition, right? So after, um, um, uh, pa Pakistan sort of breaks up and, you know, the 71 division um, that happens again over language um, with the formation of Bangladesh and um, obviously the sort of that kind of north um, uh, 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 identification of Urdu, which is really problematic in Pakistan even now, even though it's a national language. And I just I just wondered where, Sandini, you feel that, uh, you know, language in terms of diasporic identity fits in, and perhaps specifically with Serena, but, you know, you don't need to limit yourself to just that. Thanks, Zara. Um, she was very clear. On one level, she was very clear that Urdu was the closest reality to her life. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, her identity was completely unresolved. So when I say she was in a state of permanent exile, mm -hmm. it's very true. She, it wasn't just the exile of partition and the family being split between Karachi and Aligarh. It was the fact that, you know, she had married a diplomat. She was living everywhere in the world. It was a scattered existence. It was a peripatetic existence. And then they split up, she comes to New York. In many ways, she's exiled in her marriage, right? She's estranged, the sense of unbelonging or dislocation is happening to her on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. So she comes to New York in 1976 and she's alone and she's depressed and she's a woman, but she finds her community with artists like Anna Mendieta, right? It was the other third world, so-called third world, African, Asian, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a Central American artist that whom she whom she had a sense of family with initially. Uh, so Lucy Lippard, you know, Harmony Hammond, Anna Mendieta, these are her good friends. Um, and Urdu really comes into play a bit later. You know, she she does um, travels with Rani. She does uh, these cities blotted into the wilderness. She does home is a foreign place. I mean, home is a foreign place, which is, I'm sorry, I could have spent an hour just talking about that one work, which is the set of 36 wood, wood block prints. Each image is really based on a single word. And she said, for me, the, the, the word came first. The image is, uh, comes later. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of mapping, mental mapping of the word. But the word itself in many ways is much larger than the image. The image can't contain all of the different kind of associations of the word. But it's not just nostalgia, you know. Uh, she was also very critical of South Asia. She was very politically minded. Um, you know, she, she felt exiled from India because of the fact that she was never written into the art histories of India. She was never included in any of the exhibition histories or any of the bibliographies uh, in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Um, she wasn't really accepted in the United States. You know, her retrospective was when she was 75 years old. Um, so when artists in their 20s and 30s complain, it, it always riles me because I think, you know, this is somebody who really was a survivor and um, uh, the, the recognition that she really deserved for her practice came so late in life. Mm -hmm. um, but her royal place of peace, if there was ever any peace in Zarina's life, was really through Urdu. Mm -hmm. 
Um, could I just come in here to ask the question, which is from a member of the audience, and that is, I'll just read out the question, Sandini, uh, as it is. Did Zarina ever feel a sense of agency or choice about where she lived? I think that's a lovely question. I think her, the choice at the, was at the end. So she was very happy to, to be in New York. She was very happy to be in a cosmopolitan space. She was incredibly well read. I mean, she literally had five computers on at any given time, watching the news, listening to the radio. This is somebody who's very plugged in, which very few people know, but she knew exactly what was happening around the world. Um, and if you asked her, would you want to try to go back to Pakistan or go back to India? She'd say no. Um, you know, I have an American passport now. I'm not entirely welcome there either. Um, I mean, she really felt ostracized after 9-11, but she was very happy to be in New York uh, in an environment where she could just walk down to all of the art galleries in Chelsea and look at world art. And she was extremely curious and... Um, uh, also, you know, wanted to be in that intellectual milieu, which was open to the world. I just wanted to say one more thing, and it came out actually, very, this is to, to Sean and to, to Venka, uh, because it came out very well in the way in which Sandini spoke about Zarina's work. And it was actually also mentioned in passing in one of Venka's emails to me uh, earlier when we were sort of planning this, is... What in terms, Venka, you can begin with answering this, what in terms, especially given your work in the education sector, uh, you know, what in terms of actual practices uh, can we see or can we talk about uh, within diasporic communities, amongst the diaspora, uh, that engage, that seek to engage with their own diasporic identity in whichever land they, they, they choose to live in. Because it is very closely connected to what Zahra was saying, is that you see, as the generations increase and, and you and Zahra count yourself amongst third, fourth generation uh, South Asians in Singapore, um, and, and both of you were very eloquent about how um, you, know, you navigate it and you see it, you spoke about how you navigate yourself when you go to India. Zara spoke about how she self-identifies now. Uh, what in terms of identity, whether it is through education, educational practices, special schools, uh, et cetera, do, does one see in diasporic communities that in some way or the other also speak to or hark back to any uh, continuing sense of their arrival in, in, in that land. Uh, Sean, the question is as much for you. Um, and you can take the Irish option as well if you want to. Thank, thank you, Melan I, I think it ties in quite nicely with what uh, Santini spoke about and Zara's question about uh, the diaspora, uh, diaspora being problematic, you know, um, to start with. And I, I, it, it, it's it's a complex question, you know, uh, in, in many ways, because uh, there is the, the, the problem with uh, diasporic discourses today is they have become categories within which we all choose to opt in and opt out at different stages. And, and in this process, what has emerged is the fact that it has become a con convenient, you know, bucket to deal with problems. Uh, which we do not want to deal with in different forms, historically, politically, socially, and individually. So it, and 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 I think one way of looking at uh, emerging practices of thinking through what the diaspora as a concept is is to really look at redefining these parameters and unpacking these definitions much more consistently as we start to look at the notion, the root notion of a diaspora being dispersion and why someone disperses, all right? And why, where, where's the starting point of the dispersion? And, and this is something that might be worthwhile going back to what I call the first principle approach. You know, going back to the original question of why move 
and 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 that that in itself i think is at the heart of uh uh, how we might be able to land on some new imagining, uh, you know, about what the diaspora is. I liked what Sean earlier said, uh, talked about uh, uh, in terms of diaspora as an anthropological concern, you know, uh, rather than purely a post-colonial concern. Uh, and, and, and I think, I think that's, that's an important part of it because it has been, you know, on, on some level, uh, 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 taken over by the post-colonial theorization uh, quite uh, uh, intentionally and maybe, you know, and quite critically uh, for a range of reasons, just as much as silence is taken on as an important device, you know, uh, in, in different forms. So I think we, the starting point for me is to really review the definition and our starting points in terms of where the diasporic uh, imagination can start. Uh, from. And I think the other thing is about looking at how the formulation of nostalgia and heritage is framed. And I think we don't spend enough time in many of our everyday lives to unpack this unless we are sitting within an academic world because nostalgia and, and heritage are very much lift daily experiences for everyone. Uh, as such, you know, um, how do we start to look at spaces with a new sense of uh, new lenses? in which they can become new lift spaces gutted out of their historical heritage. Yes, the building might remain what it is uh, and mean many different things to many different people, but how do we start to balance that, that heritage space as a liminal space, a liminal space that brings about both the historical and the new localized experiences that we have. And I think that that's an important part of the discussion that I think increasingly we need to, to uh, uh, unpack in education. And, and I think philosophy is an important starting point. You know, philosophy in many ways is helping in, in that revisitation. I think there's one other point. Uh, a lot of the discourses around diaspora and nostalgia, and, and this is also perpetuated by contemporary tourism and, and cultural enterprise, which I talked about earlier about creative place making, is, is a constant remembering of all of this past you know, when they should be dismembering them in different forms for people to write their own histories and, and, and approaches that we don't uh, empower people to write their own histories uh, and, and individual histories. Uh, art, art and artists have done that for a long time, uh, like, you know, Zarina's uh, 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 approach. Uh, but I think, you know, as, as, as policymakers, as society, as educators, how do we proliferate that dismembering of these structures, these institutions. I, I, I'm always, I was inspired by an artist in Cambodia some years ago who says, who told me that she loved, she loved to build institutions but doesn't like to work within one. All right, I love to construct institutions and infrastructure, but I don't like to work within one. And that's, that's the kind of systems that we need to, you know, unpack and dismantle. Um, think that is really, really interesting because it leads into a question I was sort of dying to ask you um, anyway, which is, uh, you know, your comment on nostalgia and the packaging of nostalgia, which in some ways um, sort of also answers to uh, tourism. Uh, right, and that kind of um, identity building, which is very uh, constructed in some sense. Um, and is part um, of cultural policy more or less enlightened in different countries. I mean, in a Singapore context, one could almost look at it and say Little India is exactly that, right? Who is Little India for? Um, uh, uh, potentially not really for the Indian diasporic community at all. Um, and so there's, there are two points there. One is that, you know, in that sort of packaging of diaspora and nostalgia, um, and that fossilization, are we actually also uh, pinning our diasporic uh, conceptual mast, as it were, to an older form of diaspora, i.e., um, by which I mean, you know, diaspora has different generations, just as trauma has different generations. Mm -hmm. um, so something might be experienced by one generation, but only vicariously be experienced by the ones that come after that, um, you know, uh, and so 
that kind of sort of touristic uh, sort of definition of a, of a recreation of a, of a space uh, purely through nostalgia and that too of a, in, in, in a Singapore context a, a rather pretty space where you know even dirt is nicely contained within its Disney-esque categories that is Little India um, uh, on that one hand and the other uh, issue is that in some ways um, this culture when it comes to artists um, actually have a tension with cultural policy um, in, the, in the sense that artists, good ones, um, refuse uh, this, this kind of uh, categorization. Um, and so perhaps the, the more interesting question here um, is in a sense, um, you know, is there, is there always a sort of a, a, a sort of tension and a battle um, on the one hand between cultural practitioners um, who cannot be categorized. And in fact, if they are too easily categorized, we don't consider them especially good at what they're doing. Um, and uh, sort of governmental policy, uh, especially evident in Singapore because it's so close, it's such a small community, less evident say in Britain because it's more, um, there's so many different government organizations that are sometimes only partially government um, uh, that have this agenda. But in, in some sense, is there always going to be that tension? And is that tension a healthy one so that things don't fit? Um, and uh, you know, they, the question isn't really about, you know, how well can can cultural institutions adapt, um, but rather at what point do they stop, um, so that they don't kill any real um, artistic activity. Uh, could, for instance, Azirina ever have been produced in a Singapore environment? I really have my doubts. Okay, uh, if I could just butt in briefly, Venka, before you start, a couple of things. One is, Sean, we will bring you into the conversation because I know that you were going to say something as well and the question was posed to both of you. Uh, but one thing that I wanted to say in response, Venka, to what you said before um, um, Zera started to speak, but also follows uh, what Zera said, is that I think one of the very interesting things that a lot of us are sort of hovering around in our questions is that um, on the one hand, uh, as you said, there is the whole question of the category of diaspora, whether it is in academic discourse or it is in common parlance, etc., which presupposes and implies a solidity to it. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the other hand, each of you individually and, and Sandini for Zarina's work, have also discussed in some instances at length and at, at disturbingly private levels, um, the perforated nature of the boundaries of that. And I think one of the most important um, contestations and all the struggles is this perforation and, and the nature of perforation. So I'll be very interested to hear uh, I am going to remind you once again that you began with mentioning Spivak, Said, and Bava. So I'm going to ask you to, to say something conceptually about this, uh, the, the, the twinning of solidity and perforation in the navigation as well as the engagement of diasporic communities because, and I'll tell you why I'm saying this, because there is also a fundamental difference and I would very much like to hear what Sean has to say about it as well as Sandini. Um, and Sandini, you're welcome to speak from your own experience as well in this. Uh, it, there is a fundamental difference between first generation migrants and later generation diasporas where, as, as Zehra said very eloquently, uh, your identity, your consciousness of being diaspora, on the one hand can be vicarious, on the other hand can be everyday. So uh, Venka, please go first and please answer all these, and then Sean, please. 
<laughs> yes, yes, I'm, I'm doing my viva here right now. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's great. That is a great set of questions. And I, I think they are also important because I, I, I do believe in the porosity of categories, you know, and, and categories primarily are there to signpost a particular moment for us to express certain experiences. But when these perforations start to solidify and become fossilized, um, then you are unable to break people out of that mold and people sometimes do not want to come out of that mold. And, and that, that therein sets a whole set of problems here. Uh, I, I want to start with a, a, a response to uh, Zara's point about nostalgia. And one of the things that comes very closely with nostalgia is trauma. You know, and there is always this kind of a, a, a fissure with nostalgia as to why you remember, you know, and, and why you remember and, and for, for what intent and purpose. And, and, and that kind of trauma manifests and, and continues generationally uh, and not, not just in a particular, uh, not just singularly with one generation, but it continues in a, uh, throughout generations and, 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 and become much more uh, passively consumed in, in, in many ways. And, and you know, I, I, I try to recall the, the writer Kathy Carruth, you know, wrote quite extensively about this, you know, through the Auschwitz experience of the dispersion of people and how the trauma continues in, in, in different forms. So I, I, I think it's, it's important in, 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 in the regard. I think coming back to Narendra's point, you know, uh, I think when, when I uh, talked about the, the, the uh, Spivak and, and, and Baba and Saeed, you know, again, you know, I, I read them through the lens of providing approaches to understanding the world. But subsequently, you know, secondary literature, you know, solidified it and formulated it into structures that we cannot get out of, you know, and they, they started to create toolkits within which people were opting to describe and frame and construct and, and, and not respond to the lived experiences of people in, in, in many forms. And, and therein lies the danger of, you know, whether you take a V.S. Nightfall's mimicry or, you know, whether you take a, a Hope Baba's uh, hybridity or, you know, all, all of these, you know, are, they, they, they are fantastic in, in many ways because it, it spoke to a condition of the time of a period and allowed us to understand ourselves better. But when those become categories and, and structural systems and institutions of their own, you know, uh, uh, predetermined by you know uh, secondary literature that's come out you know robustly then as society we are also trapped in how to unlock this uh, 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 space and in, in many ways canon building has emerged you know <laughs> and 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 if you want to break out of that then we need to start to reperforate uh, these categories, not that saying that they are not necessarily valid, but you know, they, they, they helped us understand the world at a particular moment, but the world is also continuously a lived environment that is organically building different contested situations. You know, contestation seems to emerge far greater than what we thought. And I think another important part of the diaspora uh, uh, thematic and the problematic is, I think it's also very closely associated and I, 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 would, I would warrant a bit more study on this with the concept of the nation state and the formulation of the nation state. And, and you would start to see this formulation quite extensively that this border crossing uh, dimension becomes much more pronounced within the post-colonial conversation very, very strongly because diasporas and diasporic dispersions have been historically been there and, and primarily driven not necessarily by uh, uh, politics, but uh, uh, economics, but also by uh, uh, natural calamities, all right? Uh, and, and people have moved and, and dispersed and, 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 and then the human condition is about moving in order to find the right place to find themselves to be rooted and to, to find particular solace in a particular space. And that is part of the human condition for looking for a better condition, a living condition. Uh, yeah. And if Zarina finds herself located in New York and finding the better living condition in New York, that's that's the landing point. 
Thank you very much. It actually ties in very well. I should mention that we do have uh, some time uh, with us, but we also have uh, three more questions. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Sean to, to respond now, but thank you for men mentioning VS Naipaul because when Sandini was speaking, I was actually thinking of Enigma of Arrival. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's so evocative and so many of us have for different reasons uh, read it. Uh, but, but Sean, uh, you have your list of questions to go through. Um, so please, please speak now. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm struggling to, to, to keep up with all of them. It's a really fascinating um, discussion. Um, just fixing on what uh, the point that uh, Venka was finishing off with there, um, one idea that I found rather useful um, in, in thinking about diaspora more metaphorically um, are some ideas uh, developed in Avtar Bra's uh, work in cartographies of diaspora. And uh, in particular, the idea of uh, homing desires that are not the same thing as um, a desire for a homeland. And um, I found that rather useful in thinking about um, this sort of detachment um, from South Asian um, homelands that we find in the second and third generations, and yet um, struggling with um, the in-between experience um, that uh, is described in, in, in the work of those post-colonial theorists. So, uh, for instance, um, in my work on um, Hajj and uh, Muslim pilgrimage, um, uh, traveling um, back to, to South Asia is, is obviously um, something that is still going on at great pace. But um, there's been a vast expansion of, of travel from, from all across Britain amongst Muslims um, to um, the holy places in Mecca and Medina. And if we think about um, the relationship um, that um, two, three generations ago, uh, Muslims living in, um, in India, Pakistan, certainly in, in rural Kashmir would have had to the holy places. Um, they would have had that longing and love in their hearts, no doubt, but the opportunity to travel and to experience that is um, completely revolutionized. And of course, this plays into um, themes of, of, of tourism, themes of commodification in terms of what's happening um, in, in Saudi Arabia. But it um, also uh, reminds us that um, I suppose uh, remembering and nostalgia is, is entirely an act of the imagination. So, so young Muslims in Britain are remembering um, histories that are uh, Muslim, that are not necessarily linked to themselves uh, in ethnic terms. There's a great fascination with the heritage of um, the, the, the white uh, English Muslims that converted to Islam. You know, that is being brought within the remit of British Muslim identities and celebrated. And um, very often we find that younger Muslims are uh, reaching out to this broader Islamic heritage and, and claiming that as their own, which I think is fascinating. And we have seen that um, um, exhibited and we have seen it um, curated in, in museums. Bradford back in the um, 80s was one of just two, was had just one of two South Asian background curators um, and a, a transcultural gallery was established in Cartwright Hall um, Art Gallery and it um, there was a wonderful exhibition that was rehung um, uh, in recent times that, that shows this sort of movement from South Asia to um, uh, the sort of satanic mills of, of northern England and then reaching out to the wider Muslim world. So again, I'm very interested in these uh, trajectories, the maps, the cartographies on which people map their identities. And I think perhaps notions of diaspora can find us a little too much, uh, but metaphorically, I think very interesting. 
do you think then that one could talk about a Muslim diaspora, um, if that's uh, <laughs> if, if if that's a, a, a thing? Um, it also, you know, this is a little contentious, and this is almost like a whole different conversation. Um, so maybe I shouldn't say it. But the rather interesting thing about um, the sort of things that are happening in India at the moment about the, the Muslim question in terms of, can you be um, Muslim and be Indian um, for one thing, uh, which obviously I think you can, uh, there's no doubt about it, but, um, but that sort of uh, association of Islam with a cosmopolitan reach in some sense, um, that really, causes the, the idea of nation to go into a slight crisis point. Um, and you see that, I mean, again, again, quite contentiously, and we could have a whole different discussion where no doubt people would shout at me. Um, you know, someone like uh, Iftikhar Dadi, for instance, when he characterizes the art of Muslim South Asia, nowhere does he really talk about India very interesting. Um, but that art of Muslim South Asia, he makes a link um, where he talks about Pakistani identity as not being Pakistani at all, as in not, as having a porous um, association with nation because of that Muslim cosmopolitan reach. Um, and of course, I think this is a fairly disingenuous <laughs> argument, um, but I, I do think it's kind of fascinating. Whereas uh, what if is, is, is that sort of tension point again between cosmopolitanism and the notion of diaspora and what uh, Islam is a religion, um, which often uh, kind of talks uh, via and through nation, like beyond a nation, um, actually does to this, this very notion of, of diaspora if we tie it to national. And maybe, maybe this is a point at which, um, you know, I, I could ask Sandini how Muslim did Serena feel, but, um, you know, that I, I, if Sandini doesn't want to answer it, maybe this is a great point to open it up to the, to the questions. I'll just say very, very, and, and, and I, we've got scholars here, so I'll just be brief. Um, if you look at her work, Zara, from in the last eight, nine years when she was active, and I didn't dwell on that because I felt like that was a different lecture. Um, a lot of it has to do with uh, death and notions of light or noor, uh, different you know, notions of spirituality, of reaching through, of reaching beyond. And some of that comes from the Western canon and from, and from the Christian canon, but a lot of it is just rooted in Islam and, and Sufism in particular. So did she feel very Muslim? Yes, absolutely. But she, 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 felt, she thought of herself as a, as a Muslim Indian. Um, I was just going to come in to uh, read out one question that remains, uh, because it actually speaks to, to the, the things that are being discussed here. But also, Sean, I got the impression somewhere along the way that you wanted to um, say something, so, so do please come in. This question is actually addressed to everyone um, and is about... Uh, so I'll read it out. It says, what do you think about practices growing out of artists grappling with dislocation within South Asian nations where language barriers have alienated them? So it's actually, it's not so much about diaspora, but it's actually some ab ab about sort of alienation that one may feel within one's own space. Uh, but, but you could include it in, in uh, your, your uh, uh, responses if you wanted to. But Sean, you wanted to say something. Go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to, to pick up on the um, very um, helpful sort of prompts from Zehra and um, from Sandini. And um, I suppose it, in my work, I'm, I'm very interested in the way in which um, Islam is territorialized. Um, so in nations, in place, in families, in the ground, in the earth, um, but then also deterritorialized, of course, and able to to, to cross space. Um, and I think that we're, we're, with religion, particularly, there's often um, a tendency to think of it as something that is is entirely abstracted. But but we need to see it as implicated with 
ethnicity, nation, but then also having that capacity to uh, transcend it and trump those other sorts of formations. And um, and that's probably just even talking along political lines. I think we could extend that idea of a Muslim diaspora, for instance, um, in terms of political imaginings of, of the Ummah that are certainly not confined to um, uh, you know, ideas of connection to, to Saudi Arabia, you know, the, the, the fact of Mecca, Medina uh, and their holiness is, is nothing to do with the nation of, of, of Saudi Arabia. It's something much more transcendent. And I think um, this is where so often in, um, I suppose, social scientific analysis, we actually neglect um, the quote unquote religious uh, dimension. So there's something about uh, religion, of course, that allows us to, to transcend space, to enter no space or, or, or to, to move across boundaries uh, that are not just of, of body and nation, but also of, of the cosmos and that, you know, the most abstract things that we can imagine. So, um, you know, I think a lot of that speaks to the power of, of religion in these different contexts is that mobility and ability to 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 territorialize to deterritorialize and to to kind of re-territorialize again and that's what people do in their lives i think um, um anyway yes so thank you just I could i just was. could i just ask one question and sandini uh, i'll of course give you a chance to speak um is and this is actually to all of you is that just as we are discussing all the issues that we are about senses of heritage and access and consciousness and vicariousness and so on and so forth and through generations, um, does there come a point in diasporic identity when it is possible to imagine subscription in its entirety to its settler identity as opposed to its perceived or derived natal identity. Uh, Sean, do you want to start with it? Um, well, I, I think um, I think I would sort of come back to maybe some of your earlier prompts around citizenship and so on. And I think um, we, we are probably we're probably not talking, certainly in the case of British Muslims, about a, you know, a, a sort of set, a settler or entirely settled identity. But um, you know, a lot of the energy of, of the second generation um, in a post-Rushdi, post-9-11 context has been about uh, exercising a sort of critical citizenship um, in the space of Britain. And I think, you know, Islam um, has provided a lot of the energy for that. Um, and yet we can see how race and religion are constantly entwined in um, the experience of Islamophobia. So, um, you know, I think a lot of a lot of positive energy is being channeled ch channeled by by British Muslims into uh, debating um, the state of the nation and debating, um, you know, what it means um, to to be British. Um, so, I think that that, that sort of cosmopolitanness that um, Zehra was talking about could be. Um, channeled into transcending the nation, you know, imagining a world beyond the nation, but it can also be energy that's channeled into uh, remaking the nation. And, it, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's a sign of the investments that people have made in their lives in Britain and how, how rooted um, they have become. And yet what's interesting is, 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 is the way that people uh, pivot in their everyday, everyday lives uh, and make those connections um, to, to so many different people and places elsewhere. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Santini, did you want to come in and then Venka, you? Um, just a few things, uh, Nilanjan. You, you, were, you, you asked the question about um, a sense of alienation within South Asia. So, of course, that's a very big topic and uh, lots of layers and thresholds there as well. It's not just a sense of alienation because of Bangla or Urdu or Hindi or English. It's also within India, you know, Zehra knows this really well. The art histories that have been written have been on linguistic lines. So you have very predominantly, you know, uh, 
uh, a, a certain kind of genealogy that's been created only to English reading speakers. But now you've got all of this literature that's being unearthed in all of the vernacular languages, right? Tamil, Kannada, Bangla, I mean, these Marathi, Gujarati literature, th these are vastly rich bodies of knowledge that are just being considered and written into the canon of what one consider as art history within South Asia. Um, you know, I'm, I'm starting to start study Arabic because of the fact that I can't read Zarina's work. I can't read Urdu. It, it's I'm I am shut out, and she and she was very aware of this. The the that she in her use of Urdu, it was for uh, somebody who was privy to the language, who was privy to that intellectual heritage, who was privy to the poetry. It wasn't supposed to be read by just everybody. But if somebody wanted to access her world and her culture, her inheritance, one would have to make that effort, that, that journey and meet her somewhere. Um, so, um, you know, the, the question of diaspora is interesting because I'm Marwari. I, I come from Shekhawati. You know, Venka said, what is the origin of diaspora? It's the, 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 this desire to move. We left Shekhawati 300 years ago to live in Calcutta because that was the the center of, of trade with the British Raj, you know? So our food is Marwadi food, which is inflected by the cosmopolitanism of Calcutta, but I grew up in Bombay. I lived in New York for 20 years and now I'm in London. What does that make me? And in many ways, I am all of these things, but I trace my origin back to Shekhavati, you know, and to that one little village called Ramgarh, which is where the Podars are from. And that is a very complex inheritance, which has nothing to do with just trauma or nationalism or partition or borders. That is a set of cultural assimilations that I as an individual have gone through. Thank you. Sorry, you need to uh, unmute yourself. Um. Thank you. I, I think it goes back to your uh, one of your key questions about diasporic identity and what that means today. Um, and and it, it, it deals with the fact as to who, who defines that identity. Um, if we look at it from a people to people, at the people to people level, then those identities are much more porous and much more fluid in many ways. And, and, and that sense of alienation that someone asked about might not necessarily be set itself in. But if people do uh, build their identities based on those categories within which they're going to be co-located at any particular point in time, then those stress points will definitely be there. And if in terms of responding to the question about you know, what kind of emerging practices, a sense of alienation. And I think one of the things that we have to think about at a very much conceptual level is how to teach people how to defer that definition of who they are before, you know, the moment you move into a particular space. Uh, because when you, you, you have to become a discoverer, uh, you know, of a particular place and learn about a space. And, 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 and I think, you know, um, becoming, uh, uh, you know, uh, an intrepid traveler for that matter, you know, and not see diaspora has necessarily, the migration itself has something a uh, bit of a challenge. I, I'll, I'll give you an in interesting example. I, uh, in, in 2019, I was in, in Istanbul and I, I met uh, 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 two young men in a, in a spice shop, you know, and uh, they spoke a smattering of English and a lot of the English they learned was through Google. And they were from Aleppo, right? And, um, and, and I said, oh yeah, you're from Aleppo. So he said, you know of Aleppo? I said, yes, I've seen it in the news and all that. And they started to share with me their lives about the dispersion that their families have been killed in the war. Um, and and they, they came as refugees into Istanbul. And one is 19, one is 21, and trying to make a life and talks about how you know, their families has gone get a better life, you know? And their better life was through engaging with the world. And when the world for them coming through the tourists and Google and defining who they are, and, and ultimately providing for the fact, and and it gave a sense of hope, and and you know, um, and 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 inspired me to to look at how this new generation of individuals who are becoming transnational in many ways 
are being enabled because of digital technologies to be able to be much more connected globally uh, without the sense of alienation, without the sense of loss, without the sense of uh, a world being like, if, if at all the, the key sense of loss was, I'm, I was not able to bring my mother along because we couldn't afford for the, to pay to be, come through the refugee process, right? Uh, but we hope to save and go back and bring her up. So that, that hope is there. But again, that, that whole idea of that, the new world where that alienation is being deferred because technology allows you to all of a sudden connect and be connected and to be able to reach out very, very quickly. And, and that sense of wanting to have a better life will always be there. In, in these diasporic communities. And, and I think that's, that's that imagining needs to, to come through. And, and hence the blurring between whether they have got diasporic or settler or uh, natal identity starts to blur quite significantly uh, in, as, as I see it. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid we must now call it um, to, to an end. It's been absolutely amazing, absolutely wonderful. Very, very animated. Uh, and uh, thank you also to our very loyal audience who have sat through with us through this very interesting discussion. Um, but, but, you know, this opens up a series of questions and one of the, obviously the most important sides, and I'm sure we're going to get comments and emails about this in due course, is that to, to the whole diaspora question is also the entire question of how the society within which, if, if for, for want of a better word, the host society responds to diasporic practices, however we may want to, to discuss uh, them. Uh, yes, we have to be discoverers, Venka, uh, and as much as we have to be navigators, I think there is also a certain type and a certain volume of generosity that is involved in being uh, migrant or, or diaspora. But but on that note, thank you very much, Sandini Poddar. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Sean McLaughlin. Thank you very much, Dr. Venka Thank you very much, Zehra. Uh, this has been